I thought I told you to clean up these blocks before you started playing a game. It wasn't us. It was Dad. <laughs> Lance. What? I'm just building pyramids, sailing ships, getting ready for game night, honey. It's Emotep. <laughs> All right, this is Emotep, builder of Egypt, on the table here. Let me go over this game with you guys. In setup, you're going to give each player a number of cubes in their color, depending on what player order they are. So the first player is going to get two cubes of their color. The next player is going to get one additional, so three. And... The next player will get one more, and so they will get four. And the last player is going to get five. And five is the most cubes that a player can have on their sled here. And so what you're gonna be trying to do with these cubes is you're going to be trying to fill up these boats here. And the number of boats that's used in that round and which boat you're going to be using is determined by these cards here. And so you'll flip over a card and you can see here that we're gonna use two of the boats that have four spaces on them and two boats that have only two spaces on them. And so we set these boats over here to the side and starting with the first player, which in this example is the black player here, the black player gets to choose to do one of four actions. One action can be to put one of your cubes on a boat, and you get to pick where on the boat you're gonna put it, and I'll get to it later as to why it's important uh, for the order of cubes, but let's just say the black player wants to put a cube here. Then the white player will go and they might put a cube here as well. And the gray player would go next and they might wanna put a cube here. And brown player would go next and they'll put a cube here. Now it comes back to the black player. And another thing that you can do on your turn is you can draw three new cubes from the quarry. And so we'll draw three cubes here for the black player and goes on the black player's sled here. And then white will go again, and we'll say that white goes there, and gray is gonna go there, and brown will go there, and black will go there, and white will fill up the last spot on that boat. And now, the gray player can do something else. They can sell a boat. Sail, S-A-I-L, not sell it like you're gonna make money from it. Uh, they are going to sail this boat because in order to sail a boat, you have to have at least one of your cubes on it. And the other thing is, is that each of these boats, I'll zoom in on them so you guys can see, have gray cubes at the front of the boat right there. And these have one each and the bigger ones have three each. And what that means is you need that minimum number of stones on that boat to be able to sail it. And so the gray player will decide to sail this boat. And when you sail it, you're going to be delivering it to one of these five ports here. And so let me go over what each of these ports are. In the market here, you can sail the boat to the port here in the market. And in the order of cubes on the boat, players would choose to take cards on the market board here. So gray would get to go first and they would pick one of these cubes and then white and then gray again and then white again. So let me go over the different kinds of cards in this game. You have purple cards, which purple cards are uh, these statue cards, and you get to hold on to these till the end of the game, and you're gonna get a number of points depending upon how many statue cards you have. So you can see here, you get one point if you only have one, three points if you have two, six for three, so on and so forth. So that's what purple does. Red is a one-time use here. And so immediately place one stone from the quarry onto your obelisk. And I'll go come to what an obelisk is here in just a second. The blue cards are cards that you can play on your turn as your action, and it's a one-time use. And so this one says you get to place one stone on one ship and you get to sell that ship to a site. And so you get to do two things 
on one of your turns. And then uh, green cards are end game points. They are points that you earn at the end of the game. This one in particular says you earn one point for every three stones in the obelisks. And so again, I'll come back to what an obelisk is here in a second. At the pyramids, you're gonna get points immediately for placing your stone at the pyramid. So if the boat were to sail to the pyramids, you would get to place the stone starting in the upper left uh, column, working your way down each column until you complete this first floor, and then you would do the same completing the second floor and then completing the third floor. So what that would look like in this example, we would put gray, white, gray, and white. And so you get points immediately from when, when you do this. So gray is gonna get two points for that one. They're gonna get, white's gonna get one for that one, and gray's gonna get three for that one, and white's gonna get two for that one. And so the points divvied up here would be five for gray and three for white. And so we'll put all those back there. And you would keep track of the score over here using cubes. So we said five for gray and three for white. So that's how the pyramids work. At the temple, so let's go ahead and fill our boat back up again. And we'll use different colors here. At the temple, you're going to get points at the end of every round, and you earn one point for each stone that is visible from above. And so again, we do this in the order of the stones on the boat. So it would work like that. And looking from above, each player would get one point. However, in the next round, let's say we, uh, we have these four in that order, and we're going to use the last space there we would start stacking them on top. And so in this example here, Gray would get two points and all the other players would get one. And that's kind of how the temple works. Now we'll do the burial chamber next. And so we've got four new stones on our boat here and we're gonna bring it to the burial chamber. Well, the way the burial chamber, you get points at the end of the game and you get points per the number of connected stones. And so you want your stones to connect when you're here at the burial chamber. And so in this example, Gray already has two connected, and so they know that they're gonna get three points by the end of the game. Well, this would continue to go on throughout the course of the game. And so let's say that Gray is able to get a whole lot more out here as the game progresses. And now they've already got five connected and that's gonna give them 15 points, whereas black has two separate ones and they're gonna get one point for each and white's gonna get one point for that one. And that's how the burial chambers work. The last spot, and you've heard me mention it already, is the obelisks. And so the obelisks, you're just basically building towers here and each player is just going to stack their colors up to make a tower as high as they can and that is very simple how that one works. And whoever's tower is the tallest is gonna get 15 points in a four player game. Uh, two, and the second place tower is gonna get 10, third is gonna get five, four is gonna get one. And so that's how the obelisks work. So coming back to those cards that I mentioned earlier, uh, if you would have picked the red card, you'd get to place one stone from your quarry on your obelisk immediately. And then the green one would have given you one point for every three stones in the obelisk. That's your own plus other stones and there are many, many, many cards in this game that are all only slightly different. Most of them are pretty much the same. Very easy to follow. Now, one other thing that I wanna cover is that uh, when you sail these boats, um, any player who has a cube on the boat can sail that boat. So you might be loading these boats up with all your cubes, uh, but you might not get to be the one who decides where that boat is going to be sailed to. So for instance, let's say uh, we're looking here at the barrier, burial chamber and the gray player really wants to connect 
their cubes to where they already have two cubes so that they can continue to get more points. But uh, this is the boat here, and let's say that the uh, brown player decides on their turn that they're going to sail it, and instead they're not going to sail it to the burial chamber. Uh, let's say they're going to take it to the temple instead. And so again, it would go in order, and so the gray player would still get points, um, however, they did not get to connect to uh, the burial chamber like they were hoping, and it went over here to the temple. And so that is something to keep in mind that uh, your non-gamer friends or uh, new gamer friends uh, might not like that because it kind of takes it out of their hands and places the decision in other players' hands. So keep that in mind. You play the game for six rounds, dealing out a new uh, ship card every turn. Uh, so there are different kinds of ships each round, and that is how you play. Whoever has the most points is the winner of Emotep. All right, so here we have Emotep on the table. And the first thing I want to let you guys know about that I didn't mention in the rules video is, is that every single one of those port boards can be flipped over to the other side, uh, what's called the B side. And each of them uh, give you different kinds of rewards, not just the points, but some of them let you also get cards from the market or uh, stones from the quarry. And so it's just another way to kind of change up the game, uh, give it some replayability, variability. Uh, I want to let you guys know about that. So Sam and I now are going to talk about our thoughts on the game. And I'll go first and let you guys know what I like about this game. I like uh, a lot about Emotep. I, I feel like this is a unique game that really challenges you to think about a lot of things in a very little package. I mean, you're really only doing uh, three actions most of the time unless you do go for those cards. And really, it's kind of the same actions over and over again, but you really have to think a lot about what the other players are going to do, where they're going to sail those ships to to get their, the most points, the most bang for their buck. And you really have to plan for that. And I think that's just a unique thing that I really enjoy about this game. I, I also enjoy how quick this game goes. Um, the box says 40 minutes, but we played two games and both of them were under 30 minutes. And so I feel like this is a really quick game that you can get to the table and play and, and pack it up and, and be ready to play something else. So uh, how about you, Sam? What did you like about this game? Well, obviously one of my biggest, um, biggest things is always length of the game. And I do like that it's quick. I did think, think it was fairly easy to learn. Uh, maybe not as easy as some games, but once I played it once, I understood what my, what my goal was. Um, I always like a game that I can play with the kids or that the kids can play with us and we don't have to hold their hand through the whole thing, which we had to guide um, our five-year-old quite a bit, but our eight-year-old, I think, really understood it. Um, and he actually ended up beating me. He so, nearly won. Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I thought it was it was good. Um, quick and easy. <laughs> so let's talk about dislikes. Um, for me, so this is going to seem a little contradictory, uh, the thing that maybe I think might be a knock against this game is, is uh, I mentioned how quick it is. Um, it is good to get it to the table and off the table in a, in a short amount of time, but some aspect of that is a bit of a knock in the sense that it goes so quick that it doesn't ever really feel like you really have a firm strategy as to what you're going to be doing. Uh, you almost kind of have to go with whatever feels best at that moment uh, because Everything's going to be different by the time it rolls back around to you, especially in a four-player game. We, we played it twice, and uh, in a four-player game, everything changes by the time it gets back around to you. And so there's a little bit of that uh, kind of flying by the seat of your pants, so to speak, that can kind of drive some gamers a little crazy. Uh, what about you, Sam? Uh, yeah, I think definitely as a non-gamer, I found it very hard to have a strategy. I think for a gamer that was going to play this game, you know, more than just once or twice, they may have an easier time finding a strategy, but that's one, just not something I focus on in most games anyway, but because of the speed of the game and how short it is, I did find it, 
a hard time. I felt like sometimes I was just kind of winging it. Um, the first game I won, but I really feel like it was just by chance I happened to move my boat to the right spot. Um, and I understood each port, but I think the scoring was a little difficult because each port had different scoring and I would kind of lose track of which one was better, which one wasn't. Sometimes I was just trying to get my blocks off my boat and move on. Right, yeah. It definitely is one of those games that you can kind of lose sight of some things and just be kind of tunnel visioned on one or two ports uh, of the game and, and forget about the others. And I, and I think one thing that you said there I want to touch back on real quick, and that is it can kind of seem difficult to know how to get better in this game because it does kind of feel like when you when you do well, it kind of feels like you don't know how you got there and, and you just got there. Well, and I honestly thought that I would do better the second time around, but the first time we just did a two-player with me and Lance and the second time we added the kids and it really is a totally different game. With two people, There is a, it is easier to, to do a strategy because it's only one turn in between your next turn versus four people. Like Lance said, it completely changes. So I do feel like for a non-gamer um, or a gamer that just wants to play with one non-gamer, like a husband and wife, then it were, it would probably work a lot better. When yeah. you're playing with more people, it does get a lot more difficult. So maybe a game for couples, um, but maybe not so great for a party of four non-gamers. Yeah. 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 All right. So on a scale of one to 10, love to hate. I would have to rate this game at a seven. I think it's a solid seven for me. How about you, Sam? I think I give it a six. Um, it was fun. It was quick. Um, not my favorite. I'd play it again if I had to. Okay. All right. Well, so the question that everybody is wondering then, would you recommend this for non-gamers? Yeah, I think so. Um, again, it's quick. It's very easy to understand. You don't have to read the directions numerous times. You get it after you play it once. Yeah. I think that's going to be one that I hold on to, and we'll get back to the table and see how I feel about it after a couple more plays. So, all right, guys. Well, this has been Love to Hate with Emotep. If you guys enjoy this video, please like and subscribe and check out the link to purchase it on Amazon, and you can try it out at your next game night. All right, guys. This has been Love to Hate. We'll catch you next time.